Yo, what's up guys? Welcome to another Shamshir Sound video. My name is Ali and Adam and in today's video we're going to talk about universal rules and tips that I would apply for all mastering situations, especially for big room, electro house, future house, progressive house, all the really popular EDM styles, maybe even like drum and bass, techno, um, anything really that is electronic, loud, and very technical. So this might not really apply for other stuff like pop and whatnot, but generally speaking, these are my opinions and what I would actually go into my mindset, my philosophy when doing mastering. So before we do that, guys, make sure you smash the like button, make sure you guys hit that subscribe button, smash that bell, you know what I'm saying? So tip number one is gonna be using Voxengo Span, which is a free monitoring tool. Um, I use this all the time to monitor the loudness of competing tracks. I also use it to take a look at the correlation meter. We'll talk about this in a second. So when I'm looking at a track, I have a few songs here. Um, a Henry Fong song, Sidney Sampson, Vito Mendez, Mount Black, Respawn. So we got a bunch of tracks here from Progressive House to Big Room to Electro House. When you go to some areas like the drop, we can see here this Henry Fong song is loud. It's pushing minus 6 RMS. And this is great because then we can see the loudness of the track. We can see that it's peaking at 0 dB. We can also see kind of the frequency and we can learn a lot. We can learn a lot of information. Now with that being said, you also want to be careful. In the beginning days of using Voxango Span, I used to think that, you know, I need to emulate their EQ curve exactly. And no, that's the worst thing you can do because your song will never sound like their song. Never. Their song, they can't be you, you can't be them. So look at these as I'm soloing these. They have all weird EQ curves, right? This one got some like more kind of straight. Then you look at the Sydney Samson one. What the hell is this one doing? You know what I mean? But these songs sound great. But this you can see is going up and down and... You know, and then the bass is here, and then you look at Respawn track. This one seems like it has more in common with the Mount Black track, but we can see this one's quieter, minus 8 RMS. How about Mount Black? Let's see. And this one's also quieter. I think Henry Fong's track is the loudest. Of all these four, they all clip at 0 dB. And um, what I was talking about is with MP3s, you want to be so careful. It's different if you're referencing a wave or maybe like a high-quality FLAC. FLAC is also uncompressed. I think for Apple, it's AIFF or something. With MP3s, right, due to the nature of MP3s, there's going to be roll-offs where you might think, well, I'm going to roll off at 15 kilohertz. No, 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 stop right there. You don't want to roll off so low in the mix because then you're going to lose a lot of sparkle. You're going to lose a lot of that air. I usually roll off like a low-pass filter around like 20 kilohertz or even sometimes like 19 0.5 maybe 19 at most but like 19.5 19.6 because most headphones most gear is gonna have the ability to hear that and most of us can hear like 20 kilohertz maybe even higher than 20 like 20 kilohertz so just because you see a weird roll off doesn't necessarily mean that the producer did that it might actually just be the uh, the effect of the mp3 of showing like a really sharp cutoff so just keep that in mind Keep in mind that the result of what you're looking at is not necessarily exactly what he had at the output chain of his master. You're looking at an MP3 that has a you know some lost information in the high end and whatnot. So just something to keep in mind when you guys are referencing MP3s. Don't stimulate their their uh, stuff going on. Just use that as a reference. Use it as a vantage point. Use it as a perspective. Um, and also make sure if you're doing a reference, do a similar style. Keep it the same key because if you're referencing, if you're doing like D sharp big room banger and the guys is like G minor electro house, I mean, why are you referencing that? You know what I mean? It's got to be the same. And if you guys are struggling to find the same track, I recommend going to Beatport and um, searching by key, see what's been released by key, even look at the latest releases and grab a, a new release, download it, try and download a high quality version throw that in and then use that for referencing or EQ matching, which we'll talk about later as well. So the last thing in Voxango span I want to talk about is going to be the correlation. Now you guys can monitor this in something like Isotope Imager as well. Um, I think T-Rax has their meter as well. The correlation is the width of the mix. Okay, so 
you want to make sure that the width of the mix is generally speaking towards the right it's positive because if your mix if your drop you see how all these drops are in the positive and when they come down it's just briefly or if if it's in the break or something it's just brief because if it's to the left all the way that would mean that if i played your song on a mono speaker or something the data would be lost some stuff would be inaudible some stuff would be just sounding weird so that has to do with phasing issues you want to make sure that your stuff is not too wide and when we produce on headphones sometimes we have a loss of perception of stereo width that's why a lot of producers tell us to produce on desktop speakers but i think it just has to do with you learning how to use your headphones the best learn them very well know how something sounds on your headphones and how it will sound in the car and on a different you know system or on a bluetooth speaker diversify what you listen to don't just listen to it only on headphones take your song and listen to it in the car listen to it on a bluetooth speaker listen to it on a laptop on some ear pods because you got to re remember you know too much of us we become like audiophiles and these enthusiasts in audio and like the average guy is listening to your song on some ear pods and if it sounds terrible on ear pods you can't tell him well you're supposed to listen to it on five thousand dollar speakers you know we have to be realistic so with the stereo imaging, back to this, with headphones, you always want to make sure that you listen to your mix in mono, either in the mixing stage, the production stage, every now and then put this in the mono like this towards the purple. And then this way it will show problems because you'll hear if the riser snare is like too loud. You'll hear if something is problematic. It can quickly give you a gauge of, of what is too loud and also showing you if maybe something's too wide. If something is like all of a sudden inaudible or just sounds weird there could be a problem with the stereo width now there are some exceptions where like something is designed to be super wide and you don't care and you're just like well it will be played in stereo but i'm just really talking about specifically leveling and your stuff like drums kicks they gotta be in mono and when i say in mono they can have stereo elements but they need to be strong in the center because if the kick is like a wide kick it's just gonna sound weird it will sound weird like 99% of the time. So you want to keep that in mind. Now for other stuff, you know, your rides, your cymbals, your sometimes like weird snares and stuff, that's different. But like the core power, it needs to have that body. It needs to have that juiciness. And listening to it in mono will help you find leveling problems and hear phasing issues like too wide. And looking at something like a correlation meter will indicate to you. But usually... As you produce more and more, you won't really have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that, but I did have a problem with that. I had a problem where I made an, a remix of a party rock, LMFAO, party rock anthem. And there was one sound I made, this like yo sound. And it was so wide that when it was played in mono, I was like, whoa, what happened? I was playing it at a club and that yo sound was gone. It was gone. And I'm like, huh? Like what happened? I'm like, I, I didn't understand what happened. But what happened was that Yoi sound was all the way on the left. It was super wide. I threw on like fruity stereo enhancer plus this enhancer plus this enhancer. And when you're early into production, right, you don't see that as a problem until you actually face it. So just some two cents regarding that. The next tip is going to be really about your headphones and your gear, what you're using. So here I have um, some HD 280 Sennheiser. I really love Sennheiser. Um, I've always been using Sennheiser back in the day and Sennheiser is uh, great if you guys are just getting into production and you want to get something cheap I think these are around 100 bucks um, closed design so closed is going to keep the sound isolated and um, really nice low end it really emphasizes the low end but when it emphasizes the low end this is really important you got to know your gear really well because since this emphasizes the low end I need to make sure that my low end is like emphasize and sound good because it's not very flat these uh these canna headphones and that's not necessarily bad um, i do have a pair of odyssey headphones that are a very flat response but um, my cable is damaged for it i'm replacing it so i'm just using this in the meantime but i've gotten really used to it i was hesitant at first but i've gotten really used to it i actually enjoy using it and regardless of what you guys are using guys i made electro champion my one of my like most popular songs on a pair of logitech x530 speakers can you believe that no f given
you know, because in the beginning days, you're just very excited. And, and then as your ears mature, you start to have a higher expectation of yourself and you keep increasing the bar. But what I'm saying is that don't feel obliged to get like the best studio monitor headphones or speakers you could but at the same time people like Wolfgang Gartner a pioneer in the electro house industry hands down he says that like a lot of times he doesn't like using studio monitors because of how flat and sterile they sound think about it a lot of times we want to enjoy music and like that coloring of the sound sometimes a little bit of color I'm not saying like you know boost the low end by this and do some crazy stuff I don't really like the uh Dre beats and, and a lot of other headphones personally that's my own opinion but a little bit of color can really make your sounds sound, yeah, sound a bit more inspiring and what I mean is that it can make your songs and song creation you know a little bit more like enjoyable so there's nothing wrong with using like a pair of headphones that aren't that necessarily are a bit colored or even are not perfectly flat is what I mean at the end of the day you need to learn how well they perform you need to know them well so that you know how they will convert to other medians because most people have a room where it's square like here or in the basement square and if you have studio monitors speakers that's going to reflect everywhere you're going to hear tons of reflections and it's going to be more ideal to use headphones but you could circumvent that by if you're using studio monitors by listening at lower levels get smaller studio monitors don't get huge ones because it can be very costly and you need like a good setup to have studio monitors you need to have it like in a more of a rectangular hall so the sounds can travel down and by the time it comes back most of it has diminished whereas in a box it's just reflecting everywhere so that's just some two cents on the gear that you're using next um this ties into this correlation as well. You always want to make sure that the imaging is on point. I used to always use something like Isotope Imager, but I no longer use it anymore. Um, Isotope Imager will also show you the width of this track. So this is response track. You can see the correlation is positive there. And like I said, it's okay if it bounces down or goes low just briefly, but generally speaking, your drop needs to be like above this threshold here because otherwise you're going to have problems. It will not sound good on mono systems. Now, I used to in the past like make my mono uh, make my bass very mono, the subsonic, anywhere from like 120 or 150. However, I've stopped doing that. And it's not to say that I don't like making my sub mono, but I like doing that in the mix down stage. I like making my elements during production mono, my kick, my kick is already mono. So, why do it to the whole mix? I feel like sometimes this can be there are pros and cons to this because one would think well I'm gonna make everything mono it might sound better but you could you might actually like it without using this because you want to keep in mind if you start boosting the high end less is more boost it very slightly because when you'd start increasing this check out this level it's gonna go crazy you're actually increasing the gain you're making the level higher so it's not just about making it wider you've made it wider but you've also made it higher level so now all of a sudden the symbols are obnoxious the crash is obnoxious everything is super high so if you do want to give a little bit of spice less is more always remember during mastering less is more maybe a slight boost you know so if i opened this up and i was like you know what i want to give us a tiny little boost i would do something like that because it'll also make the high end a bit louder while making it wider um, you could also experiment with something like this this would create kind of a delay effect to make it even more wider, almost kind of like a chorus effect. But I don't really use this anymore. Um, I address the stuff at the mix down stage, and I like to use panning to create width. I think if you do more panning, you will create more width without having to do cheap ways like this, because it's kind of cheap, you know, like you want to do it through panning. You want to do it through organic elements in the mix rather than just trying to go to a tool to fix everything. The next thing we're gonna talk about is EQ. Um, now, sometimes people like to compress before EQ. Sometimes people like to do EQ before compression. There's no right or wrong way. Um, when you're doing mastering, always remember work in linear phase EQ. Linear phase EQ will sound the best during mastering. Um, I don't use linear phase during the mixing and the production. I just use zero latency. But you wanna use linear phase EQ and um, you want to do like a sharp roll off if you want to do something like that you could do like 48 db or even higher 72 96 maybe even the brick wall in the uh, pro q3 
I would set a cue of something like one like this. And I would listen. This is what I usually do. I'll listen. I'll be like, okay, when is the bass actually hitting it? Is it hitting it? Is it hitting it? Okay, now it's starting to really take away the sub. Let me back that off. And what that will do is it'll let you kind of take away those frequencies that are almost inaudible. You know, like they're not even there. Creates a bit more headroom for your mix. Also creates a bit more loudness because you're taking away unnecessary stuff. You're kind of shaving it off. And the same can be said about the high end. You could also roll it off uh, like so. Let's just go with like 72 dB. I've done 48. I've done brick wall in the past. There's no right or wrong. You just got to listen to it and see. Now, this is at 30,000. So I would be like, you know what? Okay, 22,000 or maybe like 19,500. Again, you have to listen and find that area. Um, of course, you could do mid-side EQ and mid-side EQ is where you EQ only the mid frequency or the side, but we're not going to talk about that in this video. It's going to get too long, but linear phase EQ is your friend. You can do it before compression. You can do it after compression. You can do it right before the limiter, whatever you want to do. An alternative to this that I really like, I actually prefer this these days, is parametric EQ, the mastering preset. I pull this up to 20 kilohertz, 20 hertz. And I leave this off because the oversampling changes the characteristics. Try it on and off. But I like it just like this. I really love this for mastering this preset right here. So that's about EQ. You always want to take a look at EQ to take off some of the stuff. EQ is, is very important, but it's more important in the mix down and production stage. The next thing is like sometimes you want to give it a bit of saturation. So a lot of times I'll see if something like a saturation knob, um, which is free, you can saturate the whole mix, but you don't want to do this. Like you would want to go like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, maybe 0.3. Saturation knob will increase the harmonics a bit. But keep in mind, if you do this, it would be a good idea to EQ after the fact because you've now introduced some new harmonics, some new distortion. And um, it's very great because it's kind of like this cheat, kind of this like hack. Because if you're working on a mix that maybe lacks some low end, you could switch to keep high which will untouch the high frequencies and then you could boost this 0 0.1 0 0.2 give a little bit of rumble and then maybe add that parametric eq after the fact to just clean it up a bit so saturation is really important and guys i have made a video about saturating your leads how to pump up your sound it's called because saturating your leads is what separates the pros from the um, amateurs because a lot of bedroom producers don't realize that like it's not about just compressing and this and that S uh, synthesizer sounds are generally very stable right so like saturating them is very important and i would recommend watching that video i talk about the use of camel crusher ott um, fat filter saturn sausage fattener sound goodizer and how they can all be used but something like this saturation needs to be used very slow and very conservatively when you use it on the master but experiment see if you want to boost the high boost the low or just do neutral so less is more. Always remember less is more. Work very progressively in your mastering. You can also do it with something like FabFilter Saturn, but I don't really use Saturn on the master. Um, if you did use it on uh, on the master, I would recommend using like a, a preset how I made here. Everything is at zero. Maybe you could mess around with the EQ. You could also experiment with a bit of the input because as you crank out the input and bring out the bring down the output, it will saturate your mix more. It's running it through that hardware, that plugin. So experiment with that. Let's move on. Let's talk about compression. So saturation is important. Let's talk about compression. So how often are you going to compress? Do you always have to compress? Um, the answer is there's no definitive answer. So with compression, you can see here we have some classic SSL compressors here. We have Waves SSL compressor, which is based off of some hardware. Uh, we have the glue compressor as well. They're both fantastic. I've seen people use them all the time. I've seen Dead Mouse. He's like, it's, you know, it's fucking stupid, he says, to use it on an EDM track where it's going to mess with the kick. And then you got guys that are like, have worked with Tiesto who use it on their future house tracks. So it's really subjective. Uh, my opinion is going to be this, is that I think that it's better to use SSL compressors, even though I've supported it in the past. I think it's better to use them for like pop tracks, radio tracks. And the reason is this. Let's say you have your kick. It is really loud. And you have like a bass or a lead and it's here. Now, when you compress everything with an SSL compressor, it glues everything, right? So that kick, 
it was here it had this crazy brutality it was savage and that lead all of a sudden that lead and them are closer to one another so because of that it will manipulate the sonic quality of it for better or for worse but it could make your kick actually not as prominent and powerful but if you do use it use it very slightly if i was going to use this here um, use a slow attack. Why a slow attack? Because we want the kick to punch and then wait 30 ms and then activate. Because if I did this, transients gone, kick destroyed. Slow attack always. Same with the glue. 30 ms attack, 30 ms attack. Keep the threshold very high and work your way into the compression. Leave the makeup gain at zero and, and wait and be like, okay, now we're compressing 1 dB. Let me compensate 1 dB or maybe more. And um, you can experiment with the analog button. The analog button will introduce a bit of this kind of noise. And uh, you might actually enjoy it. The analog can really give a little bit of this noise floor to kind of add a little bit of characteristic to your mix. It's so low, but it's like something that's kind of a little cherry on top. Now with the glue, it's the similar situation. I recommend just like them, use like a low th ratio. I like using like two to one. Use a, sl a slow attack and a fast release always, 0.1 fast release slow attack again like i said you gotta let that kick punch through and then get out of the way kick punch through and then stop compressing so in the same thing with here it's a similar situation you want to increase the threshold and then you're going to hear it you're like okay now it's compressing 2 db let me you know compensate for that fact but to wrap this up like i said when you're using these compressors, you want to keep in mind, you just compressed 2 dB. So now it's like squeezed together 2 dB. So you might not like that. Nowadays, I make my track that it's just loud with a limiter on it only. I think I'm going to finish my latest remix of Migos Narcos. I'm making a video series. You can check that out. I think I'm going to finish that song seriously with just an EQ and a clipper. I'm not even going to put anything else. I'm not going to put an imager on it. I'm not going to put an SSL compressor on it. You always want to use things situationally, but when it comes to compression like this, I think that it's better and more suited towards commercial tracks like radio tracks, but try it out. It might make your big room banger sound better. It might make your techno drum bass track better, but always remember, keep the attack at 0.3, keep the release at 0.1. So moving on, we're going to talk about limiters. We're going to talk about uh, what to keep in mind with limiters, how they work. Limiters, you can work with them a variety of ways. Limiters, you could have it to the point where you could have a mix down and like you could have one limiter. For instance, I'm going to put on here classic clipper, okay? You could have the clipper just catch like maybe stuff that's just, oh, it just hit too loud. You can use them very situationally. You can use them for like, I've seen engineers use multiple limiters why do they use multiple limiters the reason why they'll use multiple limiters is to reduce the workload off of the other limiters does that make sense so let's say your overall goal is to increase by 9 db right let's say you want to do 9 db you could do the case where like this is bumping it up like 4 db okay and it's catching some of those like clips or anything that's exceeding that threshold the zero db threshold you could do then another limiter throughout the chain you could always do that split the load and see how that sounds and some limiters are very transparent some limiters are very colorful like if you used something like the isotope vintage limiter it has a very nice characteristic i find that it actually adds um, a lot of color without even doing anything but you could do something where you're like you know what my mix down is around minus three minus four db for the peaks but there's this one sound that keeps going above it let me put it at around minus one so when that hits it catches it for the next few plugins and it's adding a nice little characteristic here so you could always do that so there's no right or wrong answer when it comes to using how many reverbs you want to use do you or sorry not reverbs how many limiters you want to use ultimately you could use multiple i've done that in the past where i've used like one limiter a second limiter and then the final limiter at the very end Let's talk about multiband compression. Uh, multiband compression is a great tool to really keep those levels in check. I think the tracks by Respawn and um, by Mount Black, I believe they're using some sort of multiband compression because you can see that their stuff is held together quite well. You can see there, right? You can see like 
really nothing is going above that minus 30. And when you look at Mount Black as well, the drop, same situation. So multiband compression could be used. And multiband compression is great. You could use this um, before anything. Like if I did a, uh, an example of a setup, I could do something where I do like something like this, 20 hertz, 20 kilohertz. I'll do a sample, right? I'll do a sample. Let me get rid of Pro-Q. I could do something like this, like that. Um, and then I could like listen with span at the very end. So let's say I compress this. What would I look out for? You could always work with a preset. Start with a preset. They have some really nice presets in here. This one's called basic four band punch and balance. But these will really manipulate your sound for the worse, I think. But experiment with them. You can always do a mix percent and keep it like parallel, uh, do a parallel where you do half and half, half the dry mix, half the uh, wet mix. But let's go back to default. So the thing is that it's great because if you do multiband compression, it's a bit more difficult, but less is more. So if you did multiband compression, you could do something where you're like, you know what? I'm going to do a three band multiband compressor and I'm going to compress these at minus six and it's just kind of touching the high end, just keeping that high end in check. You could do something where, you know, okay, this one I'm going to do, um, I don't know, minus six or minus seven. And maybe you want to just graze. I like to just graze them just where it touches. And then I find that sweet spot to the point where I want to adjust it how I like. Let's see if we can even use these as an example. So you can see these, these tracks are really loud. Let me just reduce their volume. So they're at minus four dB. So if we look here, what we've done here, let's say if like the high end was so bad. So I could go and say, you know what? After four kilohertz, it sounds terrible. Let me let me like kind of just keep this a bit more in control. And you got to listen to it, see how it sounds. But the whole idea of multiband compression is just to keep um, kind of this equilibrium and keep things a bit more in check. While you can also fix issues, if this mix was too dark, you could keep that compression going on, but you could also do a little boost. And you can see kind of like what you lost and what you've compressed. You can see there that yellow line hitting that zero there. So this is very technical. Um, if you use it, again, use the dynamic phase or the linear phase, preferably linear phase if you're working with mastering. Um, if you're gonna work with oversampling, I recommend off or 2x um, and use leave the look ahead on. This is just gonna help with um, just seeing more of the audio coming into it. Uh, another good example of multiband compression is going to be this fantastic VST. I love so much, it's so easy to use. Um, the drummer. Now this is basically a multiband compressor. I believe it does some other stuff too, but it's just really about level, uh, just about compression dynamics. Again, you can keep it parallel. You could do half and half. Um, I really like the neutral. The neutral just keeps it like transparent. What you have is just sounds the same with like slightly better. So it's very nice. You can really color your sound or it can keep it quite transparent while just kind of augmenting, boosting it. So Ultimately, multiband compression, be careful. I'm not a big fan of the Fruity multiband compressor. I find that it really squashes the sound. Same with the Fruity limiter. I feel like the Fruity limiter, at least the default settings, really squash the sound as well. But multiband compression is going to be good. I think, like I said, for my remix of Migos Narcos, I'm probably going to have this type of setup. Drummer, EQ, and the Clipper. And I'm going to experiment to see, hey, does it sound better above and beyond it? Um, or below it. So you always want to check and see, move around that signal chain. Does the EQ sound better before or sound better after? It's always about trial and error. And with it, when it comes to multiband compression, multiband compression isn't always necessary, but try it out and see, see what works. It's more about experimenting. And I always, usually sometimes I'll throw on a multiband compressor and try it out and just see what it sounds like with or without it. One thing that's so important I want to talk about is that really when I discovered the importance of soft clippers, they're so important, they're so great because soft clippers won't limit the same way that like FabFilter or something will. They don't really like, the way they work is very simple. Uh, a soft clipper will just set a threshold like this zero dB or minus one, whatever. And 
you just increase the gain and it'll just keep that at that zero db it's just a clipper it's in the name and i really like using these for limiting instead of actually using um fruity limiter fab filter pro l um, i really like this for edm and guys like moti uses this a lot hunter siegel fellow producer from toronto talks about the importance of clippers and um, what they mentioned too and what hunter mentions as well is that like when you use a clipper it will do a really good job at keeping that power of the kick and everything else kind of below it because a clipper will take something of the highest output like say the kick and then keep stuff below it lower whereas sometimes some of the more intelligent limiters might introduce a pumping might introduce something that is undesirable so not to say that other limiters are bad you might get great results using like isotope maximizer uh, voxango elephants but i really like using a clipper personally and um if you're making a pop song or uh like a radio song or something i would maybe put at minus 0.1 or minus 0.2 but when i make edm i just set it to zero db i just that's all i do and when i use a clipper i turn it all the way to the right this slope dictates how soft or hard, how hard the curve is. I keep a hard curve to keep the transients as powerful as possible. As you bring this to the left, it'll introduce a more softer curve. So try that out. Experiment with that. There's many different types of clippers. Um, but the Fruity Soft Clipper is really terrible. This Fruity Soft Clipper is like okay maybe for uh, channel sends, for inserts. But you don't have any feedback. Like what, what am I doing here? You know, you got a post output and a threshold. But the threshold doesn't even work the way that you think. So Fruity Soft Clipper is, I think it really needs an update. I hope ImageLine updates the Fruity Soft Clipper. So what have we talked about today? We've talked about Voxango Span, measuring the loudness, the RMS, the correlation, so the stereo imaging of the track. We've addressed compression, you know, SSL compressor. It's not always right to use it or not to use it. Use it how and experiment and see if it works, but I think it's better to use it for more radio poppy type of tracks. We talked about EQ, the importance of rolling off the high end and the low end, and there's no right or wrong. You can do it after compression, before compression. Uh, we talked about like kind of the limiters and you can use more than one limiter to spread the workload to other stuff. You can use it technically to maybe catch a quick peak that was just random in the mix. And um, the importance of a clipper I believe that's a wrap up in terms of things that I really would do um, when it comes to mastering. If you have your stems available, it's really a good idea to take a look and make sure that your kick is not being outdone by like one certain thing. Like you wouldn't want, you know, the break sub to be louder than the drop sub. You wouldn't want the, the elements there. And you can see that there clearly with respawn clearly just visually. We don't even have to listen to this. His drop is louder than all of this. All of that and we can confirm that with Fox Angle Span we can have a listen but you can see that look there's like no dynamics there it's just squashed so it's loud and you always want to make sure of that and you're gonna hear that at the mastering stage as you start putting on elements that's a good thing about mastering you're gonna hear problems in the mix because they're over exaggerated so if you had a, uh, a weird blip that blip is gonna be even louder it'll be in your face so quick quick two cents i hope you guys really enjoyed this um there are some other plugins i've used in the past i've even used sound Godizer once i used sound Godizer on my track electro saiyans 2 and i used it like this much and for some reason it worked on that track but i haven't been able to use sound Godizer on other masters on tracks but i've used it many times on um channel inserts and Sound Godizer is great. It's basically Maximus just dumbed down um, just with a free, few presets. And uh, I really like A or D, but the reason why I can't use it on a lot of recent tracks is that it really manipulates the stereo field. And all of a sudden, if stuff was wide, it's like completely different. So experiment with it. Even though people hate on Sound Godizer, people like Jay Hardway use it. Tons of producers use it. And for a good reason, because it sounds good. Um, it pumps your sound but keep in mind the drawbacks that it manipulates the stereo image it could make things sound worse and it's probably not a good idea to put it on the master usually a better idea to put that on the uh, mixer tracks i also want to talk about using the use of a de-esser before the uh, final limiter in your master now you can use a variety of different de-essers and i'm going to talk about two different ones here actually I'm going to talk about T-Rex DSer. I'm going to talk about Waves DSer, and I'm also going to talk about Waves R DSer, the Renaissance. 
So these are three different deessers. Now, even though deessers are commonly used for vocals, you can use them to attenuate those crazy high ends that go a bit, a bit out of control on the mix. Kind of makes the mix a bit more uh, glued together. And uh, what better way than to use a deesser because it's like dynamic EQ on the high end. In fact, if you look here, they have a full mix preset. Full mix preset, okay? And the nice thing is that these guys here, you can use it to like attenuate a bit of that high end. Let's go ahead and play back the respawn track. You can use it to attenuate the high end and um, this will fix some of the high end. It's not always necessary, but like if you had too much high end going on and you were thinking what way I can fix this, perhaps a de used in a very subtle amount could potentially fix this. When we're talking about T-Rax, you have this frequency threshold that shows a triangle here showing you know, um, where we're kind of like starting off there and kind of rolls off here. So if we bring this all the way down, you can see there. So we could say, you know what? I want to DS seven kilohertz and beyond. This is extreme. You don't want to do this. What I like to do is I like to crank it down just until it hits. So in this case, oh, almost like it's not there. Let, I like, I want to, I want it to be like inaudible that it's there. Does that make sense? Like it's there, but it's also not there. Because when we have it at minus 11, it's not doing really anything, right? And I would take down this release to maybe like 10 MS, even like maybe like nine milliseconds. So it's very fast, like fix, 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 fix like that. It's just like quickly addressing some of those issues. I would maybe even back this up a bit because you want to be careful. If you do this, you just lost, like the mix will sound terrible. You always want to make this to the point where it's just just barely kicking in. All right, so that's a really good use of the deesser on the master. If we move on to something like the deesser here, be careful with this one because it does clip your output to zero dB. It's a hard limiter. It has a built-in hard limiter. So let me show you guys that in action. Let's play back the track. Let's crank this up. So you see here we're clipping. Turn on the deesser. So keep that in mind that this de will limit the track. And with that being said, I would recommend using the Renaissance de because it will not output it to zero dB. Um, but keep that in mind. If you want to use this for utility purpose, maybe on like a mixer track, sure. Um, or if you have no problem with that, that it's clipping it at zero dB, but just something to keep in mind. These guys work actually a bit simpler than the T-Rex de because all you have to worry about is this frequency set here. There's also this split, which splits the high end and low end to a different frequency. And um, this one just does it all as a whole. This one will split the two frequencies to a high end and a low end segment. And then you just drag this down and you'll see the attenuation right here. And that way you'll see, okay, it's doing 0.1. Maybe I wanna back that off a bit. Oh, it's still doing 0.1. Maybe back it off a bit more. And we'll just play back, okay. Like maybe I could say, you know what? I'm going to set this to minus 11 in this case. And it's like not even there. Maybe you'll catch like a little, little high end crisp. That was a bit too much. Maybe too much stuff were stacked, but just be careful. Like I said, it's going to muffle the high end. It's going to darken the mix and it could ruin transients. If you just start going crazy. Similarly with the Renaissance de -esser, similar situation. Uh, when we loaded that preset there, you just go ahead and there's a range. The range is basically like the ratio. You can see there how hard it will compress. So I recommend just leave that at the default, maybe in like minus 12, minus 18, maybe even minus six. And you can see the attenuation there. This one's a bit weirder with the result of the attenuation, but you can see there minus 21. As we crank it down 30 and beyond, it really starts activating. And maybe I'll just put that at minus 21. But again, experiment with that. You don't have to use a de on your master. But what I'm saying is that you can, and it's something I always keep in mind in case maybe the high end was obnoxiously crazy. So something to keep in mind regarding regarding that. Um, when it comes to mastering too, on the master chain, a lot of producers are doing this. A lot of producers are actually using Endless Smile. Um, I use it myself too. I use it on the mixer tracks, but sometimes I'll use Endless Smile to really glue together the buildup and I'll create an automation clip for it 
What is endless smile? Endless smile high passes, increase reverb, creates tension building up into the mix, and then you can just make it stop. And what I like to do is like, let's say that this was a four bar buildup or something. I'll go up to like something like 50%. And then I'll just kind of come back down. And uh, even though it's on the master, I don't care. I'll just slap it on the master. I've seen many artists do this. And when you do that, you could create some tension going into it. But just be careful. Don't do this if like your output is super loud and clipping. Like make sure that you create some headroom for your mix. If you're going to do something like this, you don't want a super hot signal running into Endless Smile. It's probably not a good idea. But I have used Endless Smile. Something to think about if you guys really want to maybe just make that build up you know just a slightly bit better why not try it why not put endless smile on the master you can you can also put sausage fattener on the master you know i used to really frown upon sausage fattener but i made a video on sausage fattener in my uh pump up your sound lead video and sausage fattener can really do a good job at increasing presence and thickness and fatness to your track um it might sound bad on your track but you know i think my latest remix uh, I think I'm going to put about maybe 1% fatness, 1% color and kind of leave it or maybe even minus 0.5 or something, something like this. Less is more. The color really adds a bit of EQ and the fatness really kind of saturates it and drives the signal. So you might find that it adds a little bit of punch. So why not experiment? And the nice thing is that it will also clip. So let's show you here. It will also clip it. It's a hard clipper. So if we increase this level here, you see that the red? So that way you could keep it from exceeding the zero dB. You can see there. And that way you could keep it in check in case maybe it's uh, maybe there's like a little peak or an unexpected peaks just kind of randomly playing through your track. You could put on sausage fattener and it might sound good. So really experiment with sausage fattener to wrap things up, guys. That's pretty much a wrap. Um, I touched base on a lot of stuff here. Plugins that I wouldn't use on my master. Um, I don't typically use sound goodizer on my master. Um, I don't use the fruity multiband compressor. I don't like the fruity limiter, but you might enjoy the fruity limiter if you tweak the settings the right way, the attack, the release and whatnot. But really, I think here we addressed some of the stuff that it would typically do on the master. And again, everything is situational, but all these kind of rules are always brought into it during each mastering stage. I'm looking at the stereo image. I'm looking at the loudness. I'm looking at that correlation i'm listening to the track in mono to make sure that kick is banging and it's hard i'm taking a look at the eq what to roll off i'm looking at that final limiter and i'll look at span after the fact to measure and take a look at the loudness and the frequencies and um you can also do things like eq matching but i think that's going to be a separate video where we talk about matching the eq of another track and what that is is it's basically taking the eq characteristics the profile and making yours sound a bit like your favorite record whatever that may be um, but that's pretty much a wrap guys i'm just thinking here if there's anything else what you can also do not a lot of people talk about this if you were ever wondering you can also you can also record your entire track in edison and there is no audio quality degradation you could put this on like now turn it on and start recording when you do that there's no loss in quality at, at all the only thing you want to keep in mind is that the reason why you might want to do this is if you're ever in a situation where maybe the way you render your track sounds different you're like why is this sound different than the way that i'm playing it real time you got to remember the glue when we opened it up had a different setting for the real-time render and the offline render contact native instruments contact has different settings for the render and the real-time playback many instruments have different settings for the real-time playback and the actual render so if you ever have a situation where you're like i want it the way that it sounds in real time why does it sound terrible or weird or different then just record with edison and take your Edison and just save it. Save it as a 32-bit sample or save it as an MP3 or save it as a 24-bit wave and just call it a day. There's nothing wrong with that and you won't lose any audio quality. Now, when we are rendering on the subject of rendering, we'll wrap up uh, regarding rendering in this video. So when you guys render, keep in mind, you can always change the stuff, the title and everything after in the, the file. And you can render multiple things at the same time. You can render a flack and a wave. For me personally, you know, 
I made a lot of videos on dithering, but I'm feeling less and less like dithering these days. I'm I'm just saying, fuck it, and just take the 32-bit wave and I just put it into MP3. Because honestly, MP3 is going to reduce the codec. Like it's going to have a codec where it's lost that high end. For me, I'm not really convinced to just even dither anymore, but you could. And if you want to do dithering inside of FL Studio, you could do it right there. Dithering should always be the last step. Don't do dithering like on a limiter and then start doing fruity balance or something. Or if you're going to do volume automation like here, do the... Uh, dithering right after in the limiter right after dithering the whole idea is that it's going to round up and take that 32 bit wave and uh it, it will dither it it's, it's hard to explain it but you know when you played an old game on an old computer maybe you guys don't know maybe you're not old enough to have it but you'd play a game and your computer only had 256 colors right so when you played age of empires it would load up and it would be in 256 specific colors for age of empires was optimized so does that make sense instead of having 500 colors if now we're doing a 16-bit wave we have 256 colors and the dithering will basically essentially introduce a noise floor but then dither that such that it's it's more optimal for it but honestly for me for me i would just do this I would just render this as a 24-bit wave or even 32-bit float because most DAWs now support 32-bit float. Uh, Tractor Pro by Native Instruments supports 32-bit float. So I would just do 32-bit float and MP3, call it a day. And then at least maybe then you have your 32-bit float. You could uh, encode that to something lower. You could take that and maybe render a, a dithered wave for it. So I would render it to these two personally. And when I was talking about how it sounds different after the fact, and you're like, well, why does my song sound cool in real time, but different? Make sure you turn off this. Make sure you turn off this. Make sure you turn off this, because then this is going to turn on high quality, maybe for some synthesizers, EQs, where you didn't want it. Maybe this will disable maximum polyphony where you set a limit. And um, you can also turn on trim PDC silence. PDC silence is going to essentially... Um, compensate for that initial silence but i leave this off because i like a little bit of a gap when i'm rendering my song because i don't like the song to just right start right away i like a little starts right after like a second or something or maybe half a second um, and you can see that generally with these songs too you can see this you see here no one is starting right on the beat he has a little gap there they all got different gaps that's essentially it you can also save the tempo information in there might be a good idea to do that i would turn that on I would leave these on and that's a wrap for that. So I hope you guys uh, learned some stuff here. If you guys have any other questions or there's stuff that I haven't covered in this video, please let me know in the comments section below. Hope you guys enjoyed this video and um, you can see kind of my mindset going into the things that are really important for the mastering stage. But more important than mastering stage is the mix down during your production. Don't go to these websites like Lander and these automated websites. I think they're and stupid i think they're stupid because as a musician that makes edm your track is technical why do we like henry fong's song because the kick is banging the bass is beautiful and what he does with the vocals are crazy but it starts in the studio it starts right at that canvas right and everything he did from the beginning to end resulted in what he had he didn't get a great track because the mastering engineer was amazing he had a great track because it was produced great he did great sound selection and synth design and good sample selection. He did some great mixing and making sure that his kick was prominent. And then the mastering was the final touch. Perhaps with Henry Fong, all he used was like an EQ, a limiter, called it a wrap, you know. So don't think that you're obliged to use tons of plugins. Definitely not. You could have a song that sounds amazing, phenomenal, and all it had was a limiter on the master. So... Those are my two cents, guys. I hope you guys really enjoyed these tips. Be sure to smash up the like button. It really means a lot. And each time you guys smash the like button, helps me drink another tea and make another video. You know what I'm saying? Make sure you guys are subscribed and you hit that notification bell. And I will see you guys in the next video. The next video is going to be the Migos Narcos. We're continuing that. But uh, again, leave a comment if you guys have any suggestions. And I will see you guys in the next one. Have a great day.